Hello and welcome to the second lesson in our series on light and lenses. In our previous lesson we looked at a wide range of images and learnt that some were real and others were virtual. Today we will begin to examine lenses of different shapes and sizes, like these here. We will then explore what types of images are formed when we use these different lenses. Now, images form when we use lenses because light is refracted when it moves through a lens. Can you recall how to define refraction? Refraction is a wave property. When a wave changes its speed as it moves from one medium to another medium with a different density, we say that the wave is refracted. When waves change speed, they may also change direction. We can see this when a ray of light travels from air, which has a low optical density, into a glass prism, which has a higher optical density. Let me show you. Notice how the light ray changes direction when entering the prism and when leaving it. In this lesson, we will use this important property of light to describe how images are formed when using this type of lens. Do you see how it bulges in the middle and is thinner at the edges? A lens with this shape is called a convex lens. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to draw ray diagrams to show how light is refracted through convex lenses and use ray diagrams to determine the size, position and nature of an image formed by a convex lens. To understand how light is refracted by a convex lens, we'll take a closer look at how light is refracted through a simple triangular prism. Let's look at this in a graphic. Here's the triangular prism. Notice how the ray of light bends towards the normal when it first enters the new medium and how it bends away from the normal when emerging from the prism. Here's another prism. This is called a truncated prism. The term truncated means to have the tip or apex cut off. Although the sides are steeper, if you compare them, it looks similar to the triangular prism, but with the top cut off. The term truncated means to have the tip or apex cut off. Let's add the ray diagram of this prism below the triangular prism. And this is what my ray diagram looks like. A horizontal ray of light enters the prism here, is bent and comes out here. So my ray diagram represents what would happen if I placed these two prisms on top of each other like this. Now let's add a rectangular block to this arrangement. Can you draw a ray diagram to show how light travels through the middle of this block? Check out what my ray diagram looks like now. Notice how the ray of light passes straight through without deviating or bending. The light changes speed when entering the new medium but does not change direction because the angle of incidence is zero. Now let's extend the rays until they meet. Notice how they all meet at one point. If I added a second truncated prism and a second triangular prism below the block, could you draw a ray diagram for this new arrangement? Look, I have added in these prisms on my diagram. You should not be surprised to see that the rays of light pass through them in exactly the same way as the top ones. Notice the light was bent more by the triangular prism than the truncated prism, but both these rays meet the others at the same point. And this is what our prisms look like joined together. Look carefully at the overall shape that these combined prisms form. Do you agree that they make up a large lens that's thicker in the middle than at the edges? This looks very much like the shape of the lens in the magnifying glass we saw in our previous lesson. We call this a converging lens 
because the light passing through the magnifying glass was focused at a single point. So if we place a light source on the left of a lens with a convex shape, all the rays on the left will pass through the lens and meet at a single point, just like we demonstrated with the prisms. And if the light came from some distant object, it would strike the lens and create an image of that object here, where the light rays converge. OK, let's summarize what we've just seen. A lens that is thicker in the middle than at the edges has a convex shape. It causes light passing through it to converge at a single point. This kind of lens is either called a convex lens or a converging lens. Now, although all converging lenses have this particular convex shape, they cannot all be identical. So the next thing I want us to investigate is whether the thickness of the lens will have any influence on the type of image that forms when we use a converging lens. And I think Aaron is just the person to shed some light on this question. I have a few different convex lenses here. And what I'm going to try and do is to project the image of this balloon sticker down onto the paper. And each time I do it, I'll use a different lens. OK, let me start with this one here. Now, if I put this lens between the object and the paper and move it towards and away from the paper, I will eventually get an image of our object. There. Do you see it? It's very important to note that we call the distance from the lens to the image the focal length of the lens. Now I'm going to measure the focal length of this lens. And it is 19 and a half centimeters. Okay, let's take another lens. This one here is much thicker in the middle than the previous lens. Now let's see what sort of image it will make. Hey, the lens needs to be closer to the paper to get an image. The focal length is actually less. It's exactly nine centimeters. Look at the image. It's smaller and brighter than the previous one. Interesting, hmm. Now for the third lens, this one is much thinner in the middle than the first lens, but it's still a converging lens. Now, can you make a prediction of how long the focal length will be and what sort of image it's going to make? Well, let's see, shall we? Look how far the lens is from the paper before I get an image. So the focal length is longer. It's exactly 26 centimeters. So from our demonstrations, we can conclude that the thicker the lens is, the shorter the focal length, the smaller and brighter the image is. And the thinner the lens is, the longer the focal length is, the dimmer and larger the image is. That was fantastic. Thanks, Aaron. Once again, the easiest way to investigate the properties of images formed by lenses is by drawing ray diagrams. Before we get into drawing any serious scale diagrams, I first want to show you the basic skeleton diagram we always start off with when we represent the way in which light goes through a lens to form an image. First, we draw in a vertical line to represent the converging lens. The center of the lens is called the optical center and is labeled O. Next, we draw in a horizontal line passing through the optical center O. This line is called the principal axis. Any ray of light that passes through this point O will not change direction, but pass straight through the lens. This is important to remember. All lenses are curved in such a way that any ray of light that is aimed at the optical center will have an angle of incidence equal to zero. When the angle of incidence is zero, the angle of refraction is also zero, and so this ray will pass straight through the lens without bending. Now, let's check out one more important idea. Any ray of light that is drawn parallel to the principal axis will strike the lens and then be bent, so that it meets the principal axis at a single point called the focal point, or principal focus. We label this point as capital F. 
Finally, the distance from the optical center of the lens, O, to the focal point, F, is called the focal length of the lens, labeled small f. Now that we've got that sorted out, back to our investigation. From Aaron's demonstration, we've seen that the physical properties of a lens influence the image we see. But does the position of the object have any influence on the image? Let's look at some ray diagrams to find out. An object that stands 3 cm high is placed 6 cm in front of a converging lens with a focal length of 2,5 cm. Using a scale of 2 is to 1, draw a ray diagram to determine the nature, position and size of the image formed by the lens. OK, let's start by looking at the scale. For this exercise, we've been given a scale of 2 is to 1. This means that the diagram will be twice the size of the real situation. So, one centimeter on the graph paper will represent half a centimeter in reality. Let's start by drawing in the principal axis on the graph paper. Next, we draw in the object as an arrow on the principal axis close to the left hand side of the page. The arrow is drawn six centimeters high to represent the real height of 3 cm at the scale of 2 is to 1. I now measure the distance from the object to the lens and draw in the lens as a vertical line and label the center of the lens O. I also mark in the position of the principal focus F on both sides of the lens and the position of twice the focal length 2F. Notice that the object in this exercise is more than twice the focal length away from the lens. Now we need to draw in the light rays on the ray diagram. A single ray of light from the top of the object will pass straight through the center of the lens O and carry on. A second ray of light from the top of the object, parallel to the principal axis, will strike the lens here and be bent to pass through the principal focus F. Where this ray and the previous one meet is the position of the top of the image. As the arrow used to represent the object was drawn perpendicular to the principal axis, the image must also be drawn perpendicular to the principal axis from the point where the two light rays meet. It is also important to note the bottom of the object was placed on the principal axis, so the bottom of the image will also be on the principal axis. Notice the image forms between F and 2F on the other side of the lens to the object. Note that the image is upside down and smaller than the object. Using a ruler and the scale of the diagram, can you find the actual position and size of the image? From my diagram, I found the image arrow measured 4 centimeters. So the actual image will be half this height and the position of the image is exactly 8,5 cm away from the lens. We can also say that the image is a real image. What do you think will happen if I move the object closer to the lens? Well, you'll just have to join me for our next lesson to find out. In the meantime, give today's task a go. It may give you some clues to answering this question. When an object is placed at a distance of twice the focal length in front of a converging lens, in other words at 2F, where does the image form? Describe what you notice about the size of the image. I trust that you enjoyed this lesson as much as I did. See you next time.